Hey, I'm Andrew, I'm 28 years old, and I'm a lifelong resident of the Pacific Northwest. Growing up in the Pacific Northwest, just the, um, the suburbs of Portland, I had a pretty typical American childhood. I had great parents, great backyard with a swing set and sandbox and fort. I went to a little private school outside of Beaverton. I was into all kinds of different sports. I played soccer and t-ball and I started swimming competitively. So that was kind of my thing growing up was I spent a lot of time in the pool, traveling all over the, uh, the Pacific Northwest and just, uh, yeah, just racing swimming. As a teenager, I really started to like develop this worldview or this paradigm that life was all about me and what it looks like for me to be happy. So I pursued all of my own interests and basically began like this journey of, of self-discovery and what does Andrew want to do? What does Andrew want to do with his life? What makes Andrew happy? What makes Andrew fulfilled? And there was this funny thing that happened. All the things that I sought after actually ended up not delivering and I was empty. And in fact, I, I got to this point where I had all of these things that any teenage kid could ever want, but I was totally empty. I was totally lost. I was totally broken. It made me really angry. Whereas a kid, I was, I was like always fun loving and big smile on my face. My teenage years, I got, really, I got really angry and just mad at the world because it turned out to be empty. It wasn't giving me what I was 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 going after so one of the most influential people in my life at the time was my swim coach and he was the one who influenced me to believe that the highest good in all of life was just doing whatever makes you happy so it was almost like this hedonistic way of going through life that life is all about me so I describe myself as like almost like a self worshiper well I believe that there God existed but really the king of my life or the king of my little world was was me and it left me completely broken and completely empty. So yeah, I remember at 17, I was flying home from a swim meet where for about three or four days, I just completely choked and just did absolutely terrible. I felt like my dreams were kind of crashing to the ground. And I remember crying out to God as an entitled middle-class white kid thinking, God, how could you let this happen to me? And I remember hearing the voice of God for the very first time and he said, Andrew, you can have everything in the whole world, but if you don't have me, then you have nothing. But if you have nothing in the whole world, but you have me, then you have everything that matters. And that was the beginning of my brand new life. It changed how I looked at everything. And uh, I remember going home and opening up my Bible, which I had read my entire life, but now for the first time seeing it with brand new eyes, it was like scales fell off of my eyes and my ears were open for the very first time. And I heard the voice of God calling me to trust in Jesus as my savior. And, but not just my savior, but the Lord of my life. And I've always been struck by these words of Jesus. It's this very paradoxical statement. He who seeks to find his life will lose it but he who loses his life for my sake will find it. I never understood that before, but it was almost like in that moment at 17 years old, when I had come to the end of myself, where I realized that God was calling me to find this rich, abundant, great life in just giving it up for him and serving him instead of myself. So after high school, uh, I went away to this little college on the island of Maui and I, it really was so formative to me because I began to really discover what it looks like to walk with God and to have a life with Him. After that, through some friends of friends, I met my wife. Now at the time, she was dating somebody else who I also knew, he's actually a really great guy. And so eventually they broke up and there was a period of time where I was like kind of second guessing myself, like when is it appropriate to finally ask her out? And uh, I was really nervous that she was gonna reject me, but she said yes to that first date and I haven't looked back since four months after that we were engaged five months after that we were finally married that's where our journey together has really started so a few months after marrying grace we moved from portland to bend and we absolutely fell in love with the place we love the sun the mountains the rivers the lakes backpacking mountain climbing fishing all of it and uh, we kind of built like this American dream for ourselves. We loved who we were living with and we loved our community and we loved where we were at. I had a great job and we were loving being married. Grace is just a phenomenal wife. And then um, we had our first kid, uh, 2011. Grace got pregnant, 2012. Out came Isabel, our daughter, and uh, she's just like so beautiful, so healthy, uh, just amazing little girl. And we were just in love, it was awesome. Um, a few years go by and we got pregnant again 
and we were so excited for um, another child in our family. I was kind of secretly, I think, hoping for a boy. <laughs> and then we went to the doctor at 18 weeks and got our first ultrasound. And we found out that we were actually having identical twin girls. It was awesome, we were super excited, but the ultrasound tech told us that we needed to come back the next day to talk with our doctor about some things that he saw on the ultrasound. And so we were a little bit freaked out, but we were prepared for just the fact that we were now gonna be having twins. And then we came back the next day, the doctor kind of came into the uh, observation room and she shared with us that one of our daughters who she called baby a uh, was totally and completely healthy and then uh, the second baby who she called baby B was actually really sick um, she said she probably has some sort of genetic syndrome uh, but she didn't know what it was and the chances of her making it uh, to full term alive was like uh, next to nothing she has uh, what they call arthrogryposis, which is contractures in the arms and legs, so kind of like club feet, but in all of her extremities. Basically what the doctor said was that the chances of uh, baby B uh, making it to full term was like next to nothing and the chances of her living like outside of the womb a, a happy healthy life was like impossible. We went from being like as, as excited and as happy as we could possibly be to being absolutely devastated all in one kind of moment. And then the, the doctor went on to explain that baby B because she was so sick would probably die in utero at some point, and that because she shared circulation with her sister, baby A, that it would kill baby A as well. And so they suggested um, that we like immediately do what they call selective termination, which is to abort the sick baby in order to save the healthy one. So when we were asked to selectively terminate uh, one of our kids, it was, um, definitely by far the most complicated moral situation we had ever even considered. It was, um, yeah, it was just frightening to know that we were somehow given that, that responsibility of choosing what was right for our family. Ultimately, after we went home and just kind of talked it over with some family and just literally wept in each other's arms, we came to the conclusion that there was no way that we would feel right about taking um, our child's life into our own hands, but really just started praying that God would do something miraculous uh, to save um, baby B's life. The other thing that became really clear is that we needed to name our kids. <laughs> and so instead of calling them baby A and baby B, we started calling them Brielle, and we named the sick baby Hope. And, uh, and we had our entire community uh, friends and family begin praying for our family. So every couple of weeks we went to go see our specialist, uh, this amazing doctor who uh, was taking great care of us. So we got to hear the kids' heartbeats and we got to track um, their growth and got to see them moving around and kicking each other in there and it was it was really awesome. In fact, um, as time went on, the, the doctors began to get more and more optimistic about Hope's chances because she was growing kind of like on track with Brielle and so things were starting to look pretty good. Um, but there was like this huge risk of early uh, kind of labor and so at like 28 weeks, Grace started going into early labor, so we rushed her into the hospital. It was a false alarm, uh, and we ended up being able to go home. But then at 30 weeks, uh, she started to have early labor again and went back to the hospital, and they decided to keep her there until she had the babies. And so for the next five weeks, we were being constantly monitored, and the babies were getting checked out every couple of days, and we just got to see them kind of grow. So for about a month, we were living in the hospital, and uh, I got a leave of absence from my work, and uh, was able to spend all that time at Grace's bedside. And uh, it was really kind of interesting because throughout this whole time, we were building relationships with our nurses and our doctors, and we had lots of visitors, friends and family come to just come check on us and pray for us. And we, we, were, we were really optimistic um, that God uh, was going to do a miracle and save our, our babies. That's what we were hoping for. And there was good reason for us to believe that at least Brielle would survive and do really well, and then hope, Hope's chances were getting better and better. 
And then uh, on, kind of really out of nowhere, um, on May 10th, 2015, uh, which was Mother's Day, all of a sudden they couldn't find the baby's heartbeats anymore. And within a few moments it became like an emergency and um, they called our doctor who was on call at home and he rushed in. And um, I remember they kind of put the ultrasound monitor on Grace's stomach and within a few seconds we knew that both Brielle and Hope had passed away. And yeah, it was the most devastating feeling that we had ever felt before. Um, we had lived these lives of kind of relative comfort and um, affluence uh, without a whole lot of suffering. And then all of a sudden, like, everything in our life came crashing down. And uh, there was a brief moment where both Grace and I just felt completely hopeless. And we asked the, um, the doctors and nurses who were taking care of us to give us a moment. and. We just held each other and cried. Um, pretty early on though, it was pr really interesting to see how um, we started to get a real sense of hope that our girl's story, our girl's life has meaning, and has purpose. Uh, I remember Isabel, our daughter, who was three at the time, she uh, had a dream about her sisters in heaven and um, with God. And we still, to this day, we don't really know <laughs> what the dream was exactly like, but it, it gave us just a strange sense of peace that, again, that our girl's meaning has purpose and our girl's story uh, has a conclusion that is hopeful. It was incredible how um, all the people in our life came out of the woodwork to support us. All of our friends and family pooled together their resources to completely pay for all of our medical expenses, like over $30,000. And over the last year, we really have sensed God's peace in the midst of our circumstances. Death and suffering was not what God had intended at all when he created the universe. So this experience this past year has completely changed us, it's transformed the way that we look at life, the way that we think. We're no longer looking for the American dream. We're not really looking uh, to experience heaven on earth. We have no illusions about the world being perfect. <laughs> We've experienced a lot of pain over the last year, but we have a great sense of purpose in how God is making everything right again and how we get to kind of be a part of that story of rebuilding and reshaping the world into what God intended from the very beginning. And we get to walk alongside other people who are also struggling and also hurting and experiencing pain. And, uh, and, and we get to be a source of comfort and a source of encouragement because we have hope, because we have joy in Jesus.